Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for attending our webinar today, Proliferation and Threat Financing in Sub-Saharan Africa. Before we begin, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. We will be recording today's session. At the bottom of your screen are multiple widgets for you to use. All of these are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the best out of your screen space. If you have any questions during today's webcast, you can submit these through the Q&A widget. We will try and answer these during the session, but if we run out of time, we will answer them via email later. Please know we capture all questions. We'll be using interactive polling during the session and encourage you to please participate. Additional materials are available in the resources list, so please download those that you find useful. And you can also find out more about our speakers today in the speaker bio widget. For the best viewing experience, we recommend closing all programs and browser sessions running in the background. This will help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so for the best audio quality, please ensure your computer speakers or your headset volume is turned up. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is highly recommended. And if your slides are not progressing, please push F5 on your keyboard or Command R on a Mac to refresh your browser. We really value your feedback, so please complete the pop-up survey at the end of the webcast. An on-demand version will be sent out to you all on Thursday and can also be accessed via the same audience link that you received today via email. I am honored to introduce our moderator for today, our risk, and, our risk solutions consultant for EMEA, Christopher Stringham. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Renee. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining to talk about a very interesting and important topic, um, proliferation and threat financing in sub-Saharan Africa. So as mentioned, I work at Refinitiv, and we are one of the world's largest providers of data to the financial sector. And with our world check business, we have a very long history in the area of fighting financial crime. We've been doing this uh, for 20 years now. It isn't just a commercial thing for us. It's something we really believe in. And to that end, we founded a coalition to fight financial crime about two years ago, together with our partners at the Royal United Services Institute, Europol, and the World Economic Forum. The coalition now has about 20, um, sorry, 16 members. And we have a website. Uh, please feel free to check that out. Just write coalition to fight financial crime into the search engine of your choice. Now, threat financing is, is a very large and, and interesting topic, and we could look at it um, for, for weeks. Um, unfortunately, we only have an hour, but uh, we have some really, really great speakers today to really talk about the complexity of the, situa uh, of the situation. So our speakers today are Dr. Jonathan Brewer. Dr. Brewer is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. He's a visiting professor at King's College London, where he carries out research with the Alpha Project on questions of proliferation and the financing of proliferation. Between 2010 and 2015, he was the financial expert on the UN panel on Iran, created pursuant to Resolution 1929-2010. He was also a member of the UK Diplomatic Service between 1983 and 2010, where his duties included substantive postings overseas to Luanda, Mexico City, and Moscow, as well well as a second meant to the Joint Intelligence Committee in the Cabinet Office in London. He was head of counterproliferation from 20, uh, 2005 to 2010. We also have Daria Kar uh, Dol Dolzikova. Sorry about that, got myself a little bit tongue-tied. Daria is a research analyst in the Proliferation and Nuclear po Policy Program at RUSI. Her research focuses on countering the financing of proliferation activities and strengthening sanctions regimes, particularly in the context of the North Korean nuclear program. As part of her contributions to Rusi's work on counterproliferation finance, she provides guidance to representatives of governments and financial institutions on strengthening their CDF and sanctions compliance regimes. Prior to joining Rusi, Daria served as the manager of government relations and policy development for the Canadian Airline Industry Association. And she has experience working in due diligence sector and on defense related issues in Canada's parliament. She holds an MA in Security Studies from Georgetown University, where her studies and research focused on unconventional weapons proliferation, terrorism, terrorism uh, counterterrorism, and Russia-Iran relations. She has published on these topics in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and Lawfare. She holds a Bachelor's of Social Science in International Studies and Modern Languages from the University of Ottawa. Also, we have Mike Lewis. Mike is the head of Enhanced 
Investigations for Conflict Armaments Research. He previously was the head of operations in West Africa and has worked as an arms trafficking investigator for 15 years, primarily in West and East Africa. He was also active in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. He was a pr previously a member of the UN panel of experts on Sudan, responsible for monitoring arms embargo violations for the UN Security Council. He has worked as a human rights investigator for Amnesty International and as an advisor on humanitarian policy and illicit finance for international NGOs, including Oxfam and ActionAid. He has also trained in international taxation at the International Bureau for Fiscal Documentation in Amsterdam. And last but not least, uh, particularly since he's going to be speaking first, uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Elvis Asima. He's a manager in the World Check um, research team, and he's the manager for threat finance research. He manages a global team of analysts and subject matter experts conducting research on terrorism, organized crime, proliferation, implicit sanctions, cybercrime, smuggling, in trafficking in the Americas, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Prior to joining Refinitiv World Check, he was a research assistant, uh, assistant at DHS Emeritus Center of Excellence at the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism. He holds a Master of Science in Security Studies from the University College London. So on your, the screen, you'll see pictures of everybody and you'll be seeing us um, on the webcams going forward. To get started, we have a poll question so the first question is and and please feel free to answer this or not depending on, on what you like um do you agree that proliferation and threat financing is a threat to peace and security within the sub-saharan african region um, please just click on your screen and hit submit Just let everybody click through this really quickly. Don't want to use up too much time on this. All right, we're finishing that off. And thank you for everybody who answered. Uh, we have an overwhelming agreement here. 98% uh, said yes. So great that everybody thinks this is important. And now we're going to go into um, the presentation from my colleague, Elvis. Thanks, Christopher. And thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, when we look at threat finance in Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, that, it comes in different shapes and sizes. Terrorist groups in West and East Africa have not only tapped into what is locally available to them, but in some ways have perfected illicit financial flows to sustain their operations. We have seen various forms of financing, robbery, kidnapping for ransom, sale of gold jewelry, cattle rustling, migrant smuggling, exploitation of nonprofit organizations. Most, if not all of these funding streams remain the same today, but with a few adjustments. So transitioning on to West Africa, in Mali, we continue to see trafficking of cigarettes and narcotics by militant groups. The UN panel of experts documented the trafficking route of American legend brand cigarettes in Mali. They noted that, they noted that following production in Greece, the cigarettes entered West Africa through the port of Abidjan and transited through Burkina Faso and Niger before entering Mali. On a side note, another concern the UN raised was a cigarette trade based tax evasion on other brands which come in through ports in Benin and Togo, then enter and exit Burkina Faso to be dispatched from northern Ghana in smaller quantities. The complex nature of Malian-based militant groups and their ability to generate funds should not be ignored, especially when politically exposed persons or perhaps with ties to militant groups are operating a transportation business to facilitate narcotics across Niger, Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, and Mali. A sanctioned PEP has gone as far as using his role to influence investigations of narcotics traffickers. 
cross-border cooperation among financial intelligence units could potentially detect and block transactions of entities or individuals with links to militant groups. Due to the uns due to several instability um, that is going on in, in Northern Mali, we have seen Al Qaeda's consolidated group um, for support of Islam and Muslims, or oftentimes referred to in the media as GNIM, and the Islamist State in the Greater Sahara. Both of these groups continue to use a taxation system in areas that operates, and this is a major roadblock in disrupting their illicit financial flows. Moving on to Nigeria, the factional battle between Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa province has not hindered either group's ability to generate funds. Despite their differences in target preferences, both groups continue to engage in extortion. Islam State West Africa has been strategic in cultivating relationship with the local community in the Lake Chad area and in some ways offer similar services to what we saw during the Islamist State's caliphate in Iraq and Syria. And in East Africa, compared to other terrorist organizations sent on the continent, Al-Shabaab's revenue generation is arguably the most systematic. The resiliency of the group lies within its ability to diversify its financial operation. Al-Shabaab has placed taxes on transported goods, farms, vehicle registration, livestock, and many others. At one checkpoint in the Bay region, which yields the group over $10 million a year. As reported by the UN, the breakdown of Al-Shabaab's financial distribution in Iran region between 2017 and 2018 made up one 43% was cash, 6% um, was hawala, 25% was EVC or mobile money, and 26% was bank accounts. The surprisingly high percentage of Al-Shabaab's usage of the financial system is concerning. I would not be shocked if EVC has increased since the time of reporting. Hawala usage was much lower than expected, signaling Shabab's trust in mobile money platforms and the idea of an instant transfer rather than waiting for days to move funds. Although Al Shabab revenue generation from charcoal has been known for quite some time, the rise of illicit charcoal trafficking syndicates operating between Somalia, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Iran is troubling. Some Al Shabab facilitators are members of these syndicates highlighting that their relationship is beyond receiving Kismayo port fees. The criminal networks utilize fraudulent country of origin certificates from Ghana, the Comoros, Gambia, and Ivory Coast to avoid suspicion. I mean, just think about it. If, if you're gonna send a shipment of, of goods to different parts of, of the world, it's more likely to be seen as or deemed as suspicious if it's coming from Somalia, while as a country like Ghana might, might not really raise a red flag or Ivory Coast per se. So while on the topic of syndicates, though branded as a Libya-based group, the McGaffey Network continues engagement in kidnapping for ransom and human trafficking has destroyed the lives of many. The same network has been used to facilitate recruits and join in ISIS and other militant groups in Libya. It's been reported that the network has agents in Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, Nigeria, Somalia, Niger, Algeria, Tanzania, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Egypt. While the network has also gone about and created several front companies to mask its activities and rely on Hawala to move its funds. This is deeply troubling um, for law enforcement and regional security cooperation to have a human trafficking and a migrant smuggling ring that continues to to exploit different borders and different and pretty much destroy lives um, across the Sahel um, and also across East Africa. And finally, with technological advancements made in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, terrorist groups will exploit mobile money platforms. Matter of fact, 
some of the funds used by al-Shabaab to conduct the Dissoud attack in Nairobi was sent through M-Pesa, a mobile money transfer service. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, several money service businesses have increased transaction limits. Whether terrorists or criminal groups will take advantage of that and store funds for future operation is unknown, but it is definitely worth monitoring. Thank you. Back to you, Christopher. Thank you, Elvis. That was a very interesting discussion and unfortunately very brief. You've really highlighted how how much diversity there are in issues in the region, different actors in play uh, with different topologies in its uh, um, like you said, it it's, makes one really worry. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, we have um, uh, another poll question. Which of these illicit activities do you feel are the biggest issues in the sub-Saharan Africa region? We have proliferation financing, threat or terrorism financing, money laundering, or all are equally worrisome. Um, please, please click on your screen and uh, whichever answer you think is the most appropriate. We'll give about 30 seconds or so, uh, so that everybody who, who wants to has time to, to click this on their screen. All right, let's move on and see the results, if I can. Here we go. So um, actually only 2% of people said proliferation financing is, is the most important thing, uh, but terrorism and threat financing is 13%, uh, money laundering is 22% is about, and uh, a, a, lot, a majority says that everything is equally worrisome. So um, I guess that helps us plan our next webinar. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff too. Great, so on to the next speaker, uh, we have Mr. Dr. Jonathan Brewer. Jonathan, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Christopher. And, uh, and thank you, Albert, for that uh, very uh, helpful, uh, comprehensive uh, overview. So uh, I'm going to be talking for the next uh, 15 minutes uh, um, about proliferation financing. And as we saw uh, from that um, poll, uh, there are not uh, many people in the audience that regard proliferation financing as uh, a major threat in the Southern African region. Uh, it'd be quite interesting, I think, to run that poll again at the end of uh, this, uh, this webinar. Um, <clears throat> So, um, to start off with the basics, what is uh, WMD proliferation? Uh, in short, it is the unlawful exploitation of weapons of mass destruction and delivery systems and related materials. And when we talk about related materials, we are often talking about dual use uh, goods and materials. In other words, for example, very high quality aluminium or high quality steel or carbon fiber that are used in um, plants to uh, enrich uh, uranium gas. But we may also be talking about completely standard industrial items. Uh, and one of the challenges of uh, monitoring and stopping proliferation is identifying uh, the end use of uh, this range of materials. Um, we're also talking about the technologies, um, the plans, um, uh, and processes that go into constructing weapons of uh, mass destruction. And when we think about the countries that are constantly in the headlines in relation to weapons of mass destruction, um, we're thinking about North Korea in particular, subject to many sanctions, uh, UN and national sanctions. And Daria, who's talking next, will talk about North Korea in some detail. Uh, but we're also talking about countries such as Iran, um, uh, Syria, uh, India and Pakistan have uh, nuclear weapons programs sort of aimed at each other. When we talk about uh, or think about uh, po possible problem countries in the future, in the Middle East, for example, Saudi Arabia is a country that uh, 
there's frequent speculation about in terms of possible future WMD programs. But we're not just thinking about countries here, we're also thinking about non-state actors. Non-state actors could be terrorists, and Alvis has described in detail the activities of terrorists uh, in, um, in, in Central, Eastern and Western Africa, perhaps not so much in Southern Africa. Terrorists, though, are key non-state actors. But we're also talking more generally about commercial actors. Uh, and in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, there was a network uh, organized by a Pakistani nuclear scientist, uh, Dr. A.Q. Khan, uh, which was a global network to uh, procure goods and materials and construct items for uh, nuclear programs. And there was a, a hub of that network based in Southern Africa at the time. So uh, non-state actors um, could be commercial players, financiers, traders, brokers, manufacturers. Uh, and um, we also need to be aware not just of the, uh, the problem countries in terms of uh, programs, but we need to think about diversion centers, uh, active financial centers around the world, which may not be so re uh, well regulated. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the chains, the global networks for financing such uh, networks are, are global. So although Alvis talked about some of the local threats in terms of uh, terrorist activities, for banks, uh, particularly international banks and banks with extensive correspondent relationships, um, the perspective needs to be much more global in terms of uh, identifying and guarding against proliferation financing. And what do we mean by proliferation financing? Well, there is no uh, uh, universally recognized uh, definition of the term. There's no UN definition. But the Financial Action Task Force in 2010 published a, an informal definition. Not, this is not a FATF definition, but nevertheless, it's a very useful, workable definition, I think. And it uh, goes as follows, uh, proliferation financing, funds or financial services used for manufacture, acquisition, possession, development, export, transshipment, brokering, transport, transfer, stockpiling, or use of nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons and means of delivery, and related materials, technologies, and dual-use goods used for non-legitimate purposes in contravention of national laws or international obligations. So there's a very extensive um, range of activities covered by that definition. Uh, there's an important point. It's not just the weapons, but it's the related materials and technologies. And it's got to be in contravention of national laws or international obligations. And one of the important points about that particular definition is it covers activities except for raising funds. And when we look at some of the sanctions, which I know uh, Dario will do later on, Sanctions on uh, proliferation uh, and proliferation financing often extend to activities to raise funds. Uh, there is also differences between proliferation financing, money laundering and terrorist financing, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, and when we look at the international controls on proliferation financing, uh, we have a framework uh, constructed by the United Nations uh, in terms of a number of Chapter 7 Security Council resolutions. Chapter 7 resolutions uh, must be implemented by all UN member states, all 193 of them. Um, these resolutions are focused on threats to international peace and security, and weapons of mass destruction is absolutely central in terms of a threat to international peace and security. Um, uh, there are country-specific sanctions. I mentioned North Korea, and uh, there are resolute. There is a resolution on Iran. Uh, resolution 1540 of 2004 is a resolution that deals with non-state actors that I was discussing just now, terrorists, for example, or commercial actors. The resolutions are managed by committees based in New York, and uh, these committees uh, are in turn supported by. <laughs> panels or groups of uh, groups of technical experts. And um, uh, for full transparency, I should say at the moment, I'm a member of one of these panels uh, that deals with the Resolution 1540, but I'm speaking very much now in a private capacity. 
Um, so this UN framework is um, uh, augmented uh, at a national level by uh, controls uh, imposed by, by different states, which could be their own sanctions, for example. Um, uh, there are a range of sanctions uh, on uh, Syria for uh, chemical weapons used by its government, sanctions imposed by the EU, by the US, by a number of other countries. Um, but there may also be a range of export controls um, imposed by, by national states. So, for example, uh, when looking at the Indian and Pakistani programs, there are no sanctions, uh, no UN sanctions on those programs. Uh, there are no national level sanctions on those programs, but many countries have export controls in place to ensure that uh, dual use goods and materials, for example, do not get shipped off to uh, uh, to India's or to Pakistan's, uh, Pakistan's nuclear programs. Uh, and then the other element of international controls I'll mention is the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, enormously important body, of course, in terms of setting standards uh, on countries to ensure that the financial system stays as clean as possible. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, the um, there is a subsidiary body of the Financial Action Task Force, the Eastern Southern Africa Money Laundering Group, um, which uh, has done a certain amount of work on uh, proliferation financing, but not a great deal in comparison to some of the other FATF, uh, financial, uh, FATF subsidiary bodies, such as the Asia Pacific Group, for example. Um, so. Uh, that is the, um, uh, the sort of framework of international controls on proliferation financing. And what I have on this next slide is a schematic, which I hope will, will help to illustrate the areas of proliferation financing that uh, banks might get involved in. And on the left of this slide, uh, we have uh, an area that I've termed uh, WMD proliferation programs. And on the right, we have an area that I've um, uh, labeled overseas manufacturing centers. And in the middle is a blue block. And the blue block represents a barrier uh, that might be imposed by financial sanctions if, uh, if they uh, are indeed in place. And then looking to the left, uh, to the proliferation programs, we have state WMD entities, and we also have non-state actors. And when we think about uh, that FATF uh, informal definition of proliferation financing, uh, we're looking at financial transactions connected with manufacturing, possession, stockpiling, or use of. And, and it seems to me that on the left-hand side of the diagram, um, financial institutions that may be involved in such activities are probably going to be local banks. Uh, although, of course, if you're an international bank, uh, you need to keep an eye on what these activities, local bank activities are uh, if uh, they have correspondent relations with you. Uh, when we look at the right-hand side of this diagram, we are looking at uh, the activities of trading companies and intermediaries and manufacturers, uh, and the financial transactions connected with those sorts of activities relate to acquisition, export, transshipment, brokering, transport, transfer. And the transfer of funds in this area typically takes place through the inter international financial system along standard channels. Uh, and this is where international financial institutions may be uh, involved in uh, proliferation financing. Uh, and then when we look at this area of blue in the middle, it's a very complicated area because in order to get around these barriers uh, imposed by financial sanctions, uh, you see front companies operating, a lot of complex networks, maybe international networks covering a number of different jurisdictions. Very difficult if you're a bank to, to ensure that uh, you understand the, the extent of the network. Uh, cash transfers, hawala, unlicensed money, written businesses could, could all be involved. And, um, uh, and, the, uh, 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 and again, from the perspective of an international financial institution, uh, again, looking at the right, the overseas manufacturing centers, what you're going to be seeing in terms of proliferation financing looks very much like international trade. 
uh, industrial items sourced globally, transactions through formal financial channels, complex networks of procurement agents. Um, the, uh, the typologies of uh, this sort of activity have been studied uh, uh, in depth. Uh, the Financial Action Task Force published a study back in 2008. There is another study published by King's College London in 2017. Uh, the uh, Royal United Services Institute has also published papers on the subject. And just to say very briefly, um, uh, the typologies involve both trade financing uh, and open account trading. And of course, open account trading, extremely difficult to monitor because the, uh, the SWIFT messages, the MT103s, contain very little information about the underlying transactions. But when we look at the indicators um, uh, for proliferation financing, um, uh, again, according to King's College London study, uh, one can separate these into potentially highly indicative um, such as uh, activity not matching expected customer business profile, moderately indicative, uh, for example, descriptions on trade or financial documentation, non-specific or misleading. Uh, and you can uh, uh, also classify them in terms of those that are um, uh, likely indicative, for example, patterns of wire transfer activity that are not usual or have no apparent business purpose. On this next slide, I have a comparison of proliferation financing with terrorist financing and money laundering. And I will just draw your attention to two uh, entries here. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have um, transaction amounts uh, for money laundering, uh, the left-hand column. Uh, typically, large amounts often structured to avoid reporting requirements. Terrorist financing, rather small amounts, usually below reporting requirements, often well below $10,000, for example. Uh, proliferation financing, we're talking about moderate amounts of shipment of high-grade steel might cost a few hundred thousand dollars, for example. And then the financial activity associated with these sorts of uh, different activities, money laundering, complex webs of transactions, often involving shell or front companies, bearer shares, offshore secrecy havens. Uh, in connection with terrorist financing, uh, a number of methods. Uh, Alvis talked about um, uh, uh, Hawala, for example, informal value transfer systems, smuggling of cash and valuables. And as I said, for proliferation financing, transactions look like normal commercial activity, often structured to hide the origin of the funding. So there are differences between money laundering, terrorist financing, and financing proliferation. Um, but the, um, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to come up with a, an indicator which is completely diagnostic of, of any one of these. I have on the next slide a, um, a case study which I thought might be interesting uh, to the area because when we think about North Korea sanctions, many of the issues covered by sanctions relate to shipping. And this is a case uh, involving a company called uh, Jinpo that uh, financed a, uh, a shipment through the Panama Canal in 2013 of a uh, shipment of conventional arms hidden under, uh, actually hidden under bags of sugar. And Jinpo, a company, uh, a uh, ship brokers uh, based in Singapore, uh, uh, the Singaporean authorities investigated Jinpo and determined that Chimpo held a bank account at the Bank of China uh, that was being used uh, to finance a number of North Korean vessels, it was also being used as a money remittance business. And uh, the Singaporean authorities um, prosecuted Chimpo uh, both for proliferation financing and for conducting an unlicensed money remittance business. Uh, they were initially successful. Um, the prosecutions were overturned, uh, pro prosecution of proliferation financing overturned on appeal. Um, and, um, uh, but nevertheless, this is an interesting example of a global network, uh, Chinpo acting as an unlicensed money remittance business, which you see uh, very much when there are complex proliferation networks uh, trying to circumvent financial sanctions. Uh, Hi, 
Thank you very, very much for that. We've kind of run out of time, so we're going to have to move on to Daria, but thank you very much oh. for your comments. It's very interesting. Um, I think maybe we were too aggressive with our, our one-hour time, but uh, let's move on to, to um, the next speaker. Um, very quickly, uh, we have the poll question, do you think proliferation financing should receive equal yeah. attention as money laundering or threat financing? Uh, please, please answer this, and then, then we'll move on to Daria. Let's give it five seconds. All right, let's look at the results. Yes, everybody who answered said yes. Great. All right, Daria, um, you're up. Lovely, thanks. That's um, a good way to line up my presentation. Uh, so thanks for that. And thanks, Jonathan, for um, a very comprehensive overview of or an introduction to what proliferation financing actually is, how we define it, how we study it. Um, I think some of what I'm going to say over the next little while will cross over with what Jonathan has already mentioned, um, hopefully expand on it a little bit kind of more in the southern eastern African context. So hopefully that'll um, that'll tie the two presentations together quite well. So um, let me move the slide forward. There we are. Um, so a lot of what I will cover today, um, you will find in a lot greater detail um, in a recent publication um, that we produced at RUSI called The Southern Stratagem, which looks at North Korean specifically proliferation financing in Southern and uh, Eastern Africa. Um, so if you have any questions on anything that I mentioned today, like I say, you'll probably be able to find the answer in the publication. Um, if not, obviously feel free to ask questions or to reach out after the presentation as well. So uh, when we think of uh, proliferation financing, as Jonathan mentioned, there's a working definition um, from the Financial Action Task Force that looks specifically at the financing of WMD specific materials, equipment, goods. Um, so when we think of PF in sort of its most narrow, narrow understanding, and its most fundamental understanding, what a lot of people think of is, you know, nuclear weapons or chemical weapons and, you know, the payments that go into the trade in those kinds of weapons, um, which is true, but it is a very small portion of what actually falls into proliferation financing. And this understanding of PF is a lot of times what causes some confusion and what causes some people to think, well, you know, it's not a really huge deal in our region. It's not really that important. I've not really come across you know, a nuclear weapon on a bill of lading before, for instance, therefore it's not an issue. So that's where I think some of the confusion comes from is that we don't always talk about PF in its most comprehensive sense. Um, but when you look at, you know, the money that goes into financing trade in uh, WMD, what you end up asking yourself is, okay, where did that money actually come from? How was that money actually moved around the financial system or perhaps even outside of the financial system? So that's where we start to build out a much more comprehensive understanding of what actually falls into PF. Um, so you'll see on the screen there um, a diagram that we've come up with um, at RUSI to try to sort of visualize a little bit more what PF looks like. Um, and you'll see there at the very bottom of that cylinder, so on the left-hand side, is again a very sort of fundamental understanding of PF, which is trade in proliferation sensitive goods, WMD. Then you look at the yellow band, and that includes all of the revenue raising activities that go into proliferation financing. And I should mention that revenue raising activities, um, they can be both licit and illicit. So they're inherently illicit activities that proliferators will engage in. So things like arms smuggling, wildlife smuggling, um, but also licit activities um, in the case of North Korea, especially. So as Jonathan mentioned, there are country specific sanctions on North Korea. Um, that prohibit North Korea from engaging in certain activities that for other people, for other countries might be perfectly legal. For instance, um, you know, the operation of a restaurant or trade in coal. Um, for North Korea, those activities are illegal because they have been linked or they're suspected to be linked to um, its WMD activities. But we'll go into a little bit more detail on that um, throughout the next 10 minutes or so. And then the uppermost band um, is sort of the broadest category of activities, and that includes all the financial and corporate networks um, that go into proliferation financing into supporting those first two groups of activities. 
So on the right-hand side of that slide, that's just another way of visualizing it. First, you have to make the money, then you have to move the money, and then you can reinvest the money either back into your PF activities or into um, shopping or engaging in trade in WMD uh, technology. So when we look at PF threat um, and PF typologies across Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, um, and in this presentation, Southern and Eastern Africa to be specific, uh, we sort of have to look at PF across all three categories of activities. And that's when we start to get a comprehensive understanding of threat exposure, of PF threat exposure in the region. So I'm gonna go through all of these um, uh, activities as they relate to the region specifically over the next little while. All right, so let's start with the category of activities that is, um, what, from what we found, uh, tends to be the most prevalent in Southern and Eastern Africa. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about Southern and Eastern African countries specifically, again, just because that's where our research has focused um, from sort of the cursory reading and research that I've done on Sub-Saharan Africa in the PF context generally, a lot of these patterns do tend to track across the region. Um, so I think a lot of this you can sort of apply to Sub-Saharan Africa more generally, but just um, to be methodologically clear, um, I'll focus the presentation on Southern and Eastern Africa specifically for now. Um, so we see the largest concentration of PF activities in the sort of middle band, revenue raising activities in Africa. And this is where um, PF intersects really interestingly with other forms of threat financing. Because as we'll see, um, the kinds of activities that fall into revenue raising really range the spectrum. And they might not look like what you would suspect normal or what you would suspect sort of your traditional or most narrow understanding of PF to actually look like. Um, and this is where we see other forms of crime. And again, that intersection with other forms of threat financing. All right, so what kinds of revenue raising activities do we see in the PF context in Southern and Eastern Africa? So these activities we've pulled from um, case studies that we've collected um, from the panel of experts reports on North Korea. So as Jonathan mentioned, um, there is a panel of experts that essentially analyzed um, study report on how North Korea evades sanctions. Um, if you've not consulted those reports, you can find them on the UN webpage. They are a treasure trove of case studies and information on PF activities, and they go into quite a bit of detail um, naming entities, for instance, who might not even be sanctioned. So I highly recommend that you take a look at those. But what we've done is we've sort of taken a look at those reports and assembled the patterns that we see most commonly in the region when it comes to uh, proliferation financing and fundraising specifically. Um, so one activity that we see quite often is the construction of statues and monuments. This is something that North Korea is explicitly prohibited from doing, again, because the entities that engage in the construction of monuments have been linked to government entities in North Korea um, that uh, you know, might finance WMD proliferation. Uh, but nevertheless, North Korea has constructed quite a few large monuments um, in, uh, well, across across um, Africa, including in southern and eastern Africa, but elsewhere as well. The monuments in Mozambique, Angola, Ethiopia, Namibia, Tanzania, I think. Um, so they're, um, North Korea has built quite a few. So that's one revenue raising activity that we've seen. Another one wildlife trafficking. Um, so again, this is where we see that intersection with other forms of threat financing and crime. Um, unlike monument building uh, and statue building, which is perfectly legal unless you're a North Korean entity, wildlife trafficking is inherently an illicit activity. So it's an illicit revenue raising activity. But again, something that we see quite, um, or that we have seen some instances of um, North Korea engaging in this in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, North Korean labor. Um, so North Korea exports um, its nationals, its workers, um, to raise revenue for the regime. So they'll send these workers abroad. Um, a large chunk of the salary of these laborers is confiscated by the North Korean regime, um, again, as a revenue-raising scheme. Um, and in Southern and Eastern Africa specifically, where we see a lot of North Korean labor, or have seen in the past, uh, is in the construction sectors as well as in the medical center. So there are medical centers um, that are operated by uh, North Korean individuals. I should note, as of the end of 2019, all countries should have repatriated 
North Korean uh, laborers abroad. Um, don't think that's actually the case. Um, so we do suspect that there are still laborers left abroad, um, North Korean laborers raising revenue for the regime. And then finally, this is a big one in sub-Saharan Africa uh, for North Korea, and that is um, the sale of conventional weapons. Um, and I know that Mike's going to talk a little bit more about conventional proliferation later, um, but that is something that North Korea engages in in the region to raise revenue. And when I say conventional weapons trade or military cooperation, that really does run the spectrum of you know, selling weapons and weapons parts uh, to building or helping build um, ammunition factories, to training military personnel, to conducting refurbishments on um, military equipment. So it really does run the spectrum. So that's North Korean activities in the region from a revenue raising perspective. Um, then let's move on to trade and proliferation sensitive goods. And I won't stay on this one for too long, um, simply because it's not a major threat to the region. That's that sort of basic foundational um, kind of definition of PF, trade and WMD sensitive goods. So it's not a huge, huge threat um, to the region. Um, mostly we see this threat where there are industries that exist that use or produce proliferation sensitive goods. Um, but the region is not completely exempt because, as Jonathan mentioned, dual-use goods and proliferation-sensitive goods are used in a variety of industries. I have put up pictures of just a few, aerospace sector, automobile sector, petroleum sector, air conditioners apparently have potentially proliferation-sensitive uh, parts in them. So it is very, very hard to actually know if you're, you know, engaging or supporting proliferation-related trade because these materials kind of span um, a lot of a lot of sectors. Um, so the region might nevertheless be exposed to them. Additionally, the region might act as a transshipment point. So that is the port of Durban, that photo there. Um, and there have been cases of proliferation sensitive goods shipped from one country through an African country, so through the port of Durban, um, and onwards towards um, North Korea, potentially. So again, something to keep in mind in the region being a transshipment point. And then um, the last category of PF activity uh, is that sort of broadest one. So the financial and corporate infrastructure uh, that supports the first two. So that allows North Korea to engage in the first two types of activities, to raise the revenue and then to move the revenue. Um, so there we look at, um, you know, how North Korea moves money um, through the financial system, sometimes outside of it as well. Um, so like other forms of financial um, crime, North Korea uses front companies, um, shell companies, and um, essentially, yeah, all different types of company or um, financial crime, essentially, um, patterns basically to that a lot of you might already be familiar with other forms from other forms of financial crime um, to engage in its PF activities. Um, one important one that I do want to mention is the use of diplomats and embassies. We see North Korea using its embassies abroad and there are quite a few in sub-Saharan Africa um, to raise revenue and to also um, kind of create financial access points through its diplomats. I'm going to pause or I'm going to start the presentation there. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, we can certainly go into them into the Q&A and talk a little bit about sort of what are the weak spots um, within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, its legislation and other vulnerabilities that might allow for some of these activities to actually take place because it is very much a dual sort of, there's two sides to the coin. The threat has to exist and then the vulnerability has to exist to allow that threat to materialize. Um, so we can address all of that in uh, a little bit more detail in the Q&A, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Daria. That's a very interesting presentation. It really highlights the, the fact that there's a lot of actors in play, uh, not necessarily from the region. Um, it's one of the downsides, I guess, of globalization. Um, Moving on to the, the final poll question, I think, um, we have, do you believe proliferation threat financing is on the rise within the region? Oh, sorry. Yes, please, please click on here and, and put in your, your answers. And we can move on to uh, the last presentation. 
If you have any questions, there is a, a question function in the um, um, interface. Please just drop them in. If it's something quick, we'll just answer right there. And if we have something interesting, and I hope we do, then we can take a little bit of time at the end to cover that. So I hope people have, have answered um, on the question and we will look at the results. Um, vast majority say yes, they think that proliferation threat financing is on the rise. So maybe um, the people who thought that the topic wasn't uh, that important at the beginning or or equally uh, important with other topics. Um, well, maybe that will change over the next couple of years. And now we're on to our final presentation, uh, Mr. Mike Lewis. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much. Um, so I'll speak very briefly. Um, we've had uh, um, fantastic um, and very detailed overviews of um, the kinds of threats that um, we're talking about uh, from Elvis's presentation and from uh, Jonathan and Daria, very detailed overviews of um, the kinds of mechanics and mechanisms through which these kinds of threats are financed. Um, what I want to do is, uh, from our own, from my own organization, uh, conflict armament research, from my own organization's experience, I want to talk um, a little about um, the sort of practical implications, particularly for finance professionals, um, of what these uh, these kinds of uh, proliferation uh, financing mechanisms uh, mean for uh, financial practice. Um, something that uh, all the speakers have highlighted uh, today is the fact that there are key information gaps uh, about um, the entities involved in uh, proliferation financing and the way in which money is uh, moved around. My organization conducts uh, field investigations, essentially, in over 25 countries um, uh, into the illicit uh, trafficking and proliferation of conventional weapons, primarily. Um, and so we encounter these information gaps as well in our own uh, field investigations. And I wanted to just talk through um, two examples where um, some of these key information gaps um, uh, existed and how, uh, in our experience, they might be um, overcome. So this is the first uh, example. This is an example from South Sudan, where my organization worked for um, uh, five or six years. Um, as you know, there was a civil war which began, uh, well, the latest iteration of the civil war began uh, at the end of 2013. And uh, around the middle of 2014, um, as you can see from the diagram on the left, um, one of the parties to the conflict, uh, the government of South Sudan, uh, that's to say the government of the Republic of South Sudan, GRSS, uh, attempted to procure approximately $169 million worth of uh, conventional weapons, um, the, the list of those weapons is, is the top right um, uh, diagram, and below that you can see uh, on the ground some of our field investigators examining uh, similar weapons um, in South Sudan itself. Um, so they attempted to procure these weapons uh, from an international arms broker based in the Middle East, and they signed a kind of umbrella weapons contract with that uh, broker to provide the, uh, the weapons. That broker then went to an exporter uh, in Eastern Europe um, to buy at least a, a slice of the weapons. And the idea was that that exporter would ship weapons directly to uh, the government of uh, South Sudan. Um, so that's a very kind of typical setup for a large uh, uh, um, state-backed uh, conventional weapons uh, deal. It was, uh, there was no UN arms embargo at that time on South Sudan, but there was a European Union arms embargo, which prohibited European Union individuals and, and companies from engaging in these kinds of transactions. So this is ostensibly uh, a, an unpalatable uh, transaction, but a legal one. Then uh, sometime in the middle of the negotiations for this uh, contract, the, uh, the exporter in Eastern Europe decided that they would interpose an intermediate contract vehicle into the, uh, into the deal. This, uh, this UK limited company uh, registered at a mailbox uh, address in uh, central London, as you can see from the photograph. And the idea was that uh, this vehicle would be used essentially to skim money off the contract, to pay it back as kickbacks to uh, uh, officials and um, and uh, uh, company uh, officials. Um, 
So you put a you put a, a UK limited company in the middle. Uh, they, in theory, buy the weapons from uh, the uh, Eastern European arms exporter. They uh, introduce a fictitious margin, and uh, they sell the weapons on, in theory, to uh, the government of South Sudan. And as you will know, um, UK both UK limited companies and UK limited liability partnerships have become the kind of um, uh, vehicle of choice for both money launderers and often. Um, uh, 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 weapons proliferators to use as um, uh, illicit vehicles of skimming money for this for this kind of thing. Um, so now this is an illegal deal because it violates the EU uh, arms embargo on South Sudan, and also uh, this UK company is acting in theory as a weapons broker, and it doesn't have a license from the UK authorities to do so. And of course, each of these companies has a bank account. The uh, the Middle Eastern arms broker at the headquarters of Middle Eastern Bank. Uh, the Eastern European exporter from an Eastern European bank and the UK limited company uh, has a dollar account at a Latvian bank. And each of those banks, of course, have correspondent banks in order for them to transact in what was uh, a dollar uh, denominated transaction. So now you've got a real problem because uh, none of these banks can see that there is an illicit transaction going on. You've got payments going from the UK limited company to the Eastern European uh, arms exporter. There's nothing ostensibly illegal about that. You've got payments going from the uh, uh, from the arms exporter uh, to the broker in the Middle East. Again, no, nothing uh, illicit about that. The only payment that involves the government of South Sudan, the sanctioned entity, is the one that goes from them to the arms broker in the Middle East. But of course, the arms broker in the Middle East is allowed to uh, sell weapons to South Sudan. So without kind of information sharing between the banks involved in this transaction, or without the clear red flags posed by the uh, bizarre UK limited company that was used as the, as the vehicle for corruption in this deal, without that kind of information, um, none of the parties in this transaction can see that actually uh, a European Union arms embargo is being violated. So those are kind of uh, information gaps that are generated by the nature of the international financial system itself. And then very briefly to finish off, um, this is an example of uh, kind of information gaps that are generated by um, opacity, uh, corporate opacity and financial opacity within sub-Saharan Africa itself. Um, so this is a good example um, of, so here is a, a Nigerian individual. I know we've got Nigerian uh, participants in the audience, so you may be familiar with this, uh, with this example, uh, which we've been investigating more recently. A uh, Nigerian individual, uh, Ali uh, Abbas Jega, who was uh, convicted in uh, 2010 of uh, importing a very large quantity of Iranian conventional weapons in through Lagos port in Nigeria. Um, he was arrested along with a member of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps um, and uh, sentenced uh, to a couple of years in prison in Nigeria for this uh, shipment which violated UN sanctions on Iran. And on the right, you can see the, uh, the OFAC designation uh, for this individual. Now, you've got two problems here. One is that there are no companies, no corporate entities listed in this OFAC designation as being linked to Ali Jager. So if you're a bank in Nigeria or elsewhere, you want to avoid doing business with Mr. Jager or Mr. Jager's companies, you don't have a lot of leads from the, uh, from the OFAC uh, um, designation itself. The second problem is that the address given, the only real identifier uh, address given in the OFAC designation is actually wrong. As you can see on the left, this is the bill of lading from the Iranian uh, weapon shipment, uh, and it lists his address as Suite 6B at Mangal Plaza in Rakshaw Street in Abuja. On the right, it just lists 6B Rakshaw Street. Seems like a, a, a small um, uh, difference, but actually on the map here, you can see that actually these two locations are about a kilometer apart in, uh, in uh, Abuja. We only discovered this when we went to the, the address listed in the uh, in the OFAC listing, and uh, there was no 6B there at all. And we finally figured out after driving around for a couple of hours that uh, the um, the actual address was a Plaza, um, just uh, about a kilometer away. Um, when we reached that uh, address, um, and this I think is the value of doing these kinds of very simple on the ground verifications, um, there was a, a, a company um, uh, name sticker on the on the door, which you can see in this in this uh, picture, Green Technologies um, Limited, and, a, and a, a, it, although it had been torn off slightly, the partial uh, number of a, of the company's registration number from the Nigerian uh, Corporate uh, Affairs Commission now. 
uh, Nigerian participants will know that it's uh, it's not always that easy to get information out of the Nigerian company register. You often have to be a, a lawyer who's registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission in order to get information out, and you can't search that register by the name of the directors or the shareholders. So the only way to find a company that is linked to Mr. Jago is to physically go to this individual's office and see who's who's physically there in the building. And in this case, we were then able to go back to the uh, Corporate Affairs Commission and find this other company, Green Technologies Commission, of which uh, Mr. Jake is a 30% shareholder, um, and uh, and find a number of other identifiers and uh, addresses and phone numbers for this individual. And then using those addresses and phone numbers, we were able to find this second company, Asio Afric Business International, which is also active, continues to be active in Abuja, even though its single largest shareholder is, again, this OFAC uh, sanctioned um, individual. So those are two very brief uh, examples. I've run through them quite quickly. But I think what they draw out is both some of the challenges for financial institutions and investigators of finding uh, uh, these kinds of sanctioned corrupt entities, and also the value of really getting on the ground um, and finding non-public data that may not be available on the internet, but, but which investigators and financial institutions can, can check out pretty easily if they if they are trying to ascertain who really owns a company or an individual that might be linked to to proliferation financing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, thank you everybody for joining today. We've seen from um, the number of participants in the web uh, call today, as well as the engagement and the answers to the poll questions, that people really see that this is an important issue for the area. And and at one, and you know we've had some really really great presentations on this, which have really highlighted a lot of the issues, and have also highlighted the fact that one hour just doesn't do justice to the topic. Um, we don't really have time anymore for any questions. Any questions that we didn't answer via the question function will take up um, later. Um, I kindly ask everybody to stay engaged with us on this. Like I said at the beginning, this is a topic that we believe is very important, and where we want to do our part to help. Uh, you know, make the, the, the everything better. So please reach out to us, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like. Um, you'll be getting the recording and the slides on Thursday. So look forward to that. Thank you very much for joining us today. I look forward to, to hearing from you all in the future. And thank you one more time to our present uh, presenters for amazing and, and wonderful and informative uh, presentations. Um, have a nice day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.